Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Why do we call part of our Bible the New Testament and part of it the Old Testament? Well, we'll answer that question as we look at the New Covenant in Isaiah chapter 42. Hello, I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado, and you're listening to our daily podcast on the key chapters of the Bible. Today, we're turning to Isaiah chapter 42. Now, Isaiah 42 continues the teaching that there is coming a new kingdom and a person who has been appointed to rule that kingdom. But Isaiah 42 also introduces to us a new perspective on this ruler. Today, we're going to find out he is also a servant. If you look at verse 1, it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, this is a key verse and a key chapter for many reasons. For one thing, and, and this is a biggie, chapter 42 is the first of four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. Now, if you've never heard the term servant song before, let me introduce you to this important concept. Bible students have long noticed that in the midst of the overall message of the book of Isaiah, which is, of course, that God is bringing indictment upon Israel and Judah and the nations, and how everyone has violated their covenants with God, Uh, the Jews violated their covenant with God through the Mosaic Covenant, even the nations have violated their covenant with God through breaking the Noahic Covenant. We saw that back in chapter 24, verse 5. And so the whole book of Isaiah is just looking forward to this time when God will establish a new kingdom where everyone will obey God and walk in His righteousness and His holiness. But in the midst of this overarching message or theme through the book of Isaiah, today we come to the first of these four servant songs, which gives us even greater detail to who this servant is or who this ruler is and how we can identify him. And so the four servant songs in Isaiah are found in chapters 42, 49, 50, and at the end of 52 and all of 53. Now, if you look at Isaiah, you're going to find there's even more references to servants in that book. But these passages are the ones that we call the servant songs because they speak of this servant in just much greater detail. Now, for us as Christians, we understand that Jesus is the servant that's being spoken of in these passages here. And as we look at them, I hope we're going to be blown away just by the precision of their prophecy. And yet we should also note uh, that even to this day, uh, Jewish folks will look at this and say, no, Israel is the servant that's being spoken of here. And on the one hand, I want to recognize that that might seem like it's the case. For instance, if you look back at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, verse 8 says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from this remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. And so right there, Israel is being addressed in verse eight. She's called the servant in verse nine. And if we just saw this verse, it would seem that the servant is Israel. In fact, we agree that here it definitely is. But as we go through the rest of Isaiah and look at these four servant songs, we'll see that initially Israel was appointed to be the servant, but she has forfeited her role because of her sin. And and that's why this new servant must step forward to fulfill these prophecies. And that new servant is our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we can see this in the opening verses to Isaiah chapter 42. If you look back at Isaiah chapter 42, it circles back to this servant and now pinpoints that this servant is a specific person specifically a man. And this is an important distinction because when the Lord refers to Judah and Israel collectively as a nation, he uses a feminine pronoun for it. We see this throughout the book of Isaiah. I mean, just yesterday in Isaiah 40 verse 2, we read where it says, speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so it's pretty clear here that when Israel is being mentioned, she's a her. But as we turn out Isaiah chapter 42, the servant is a he. And so here in Isaiah 42, we're seeing that this servant is a different person who has a different role than God has given Israel in Isaiah 41. And not only would we say this, but even the Bible says this. Matthew 12, 18 to 20, cite this specific passage, verses 1 to 3 here, saying that Isaiah's words were fulfilled by Jesus. So let's look at what these words have to say about who Jesus is or who this coming servant is. Going back to verse 1, verse 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. Okay, now look, we're going to pause again. Uh, because this is also a really cool passage about the, the Trinity. Once again, Isaiah is pulling back this curtain on the nature of God, and he's showing us the triune nature of who our Lord is. Notice in verse 1, where it's clearly the, the Lord here. This is Yahweh speaking this passage. 
And yet he is also speaking of his servant who is to come that we know is Jesus. And upon him will be the spirit of the Lord. And so once again, we see all three members of the Trinity represented in the book of Isaiah. Now, as cool as that is, let's not lose sight, though, of the message that Isaiah is giving us here about who this servant is and what he does. And so going back to verse 1, verse 1 tells us that the Lord has chosen this servant and he delights in him. Now, this corresponds to Jesus' baptism when the Father spoke audibly to the crowds and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Going on, this passage also tells us that this servant's job is to bring justice to the nations. But in verses 2 and 3, His ministry will not be characterized as being just like this loud, obnoxious ministry. Instead, in verse 3, he'll be known for his grace and his compassion. And the result of his ministry, the result of his service, will be that justice is finally established among the nations. That's in verse 4. Now, as great as this is to hear, how will these things happen? Well, that brings us down to verse 6. In verse 6, in order for this servant to bring justice to the nations, God has appointed him to be a covenant with the people and a light to the nations. Now let's stop there, because that word covenant should cause us just to sit up and take notice. After all, we have seen throughout our study in the scriptures so far, God is a covenant-making God. A covenant is a formal agreement of promises that one person makes to another. God made a covenant with Adam, but Adam broke it. God made a covenant with Noah and the nations, but we saw they broke it. God made a covenant with Abraham and Moses and the Jewish people, and yet they broke those covenants as well. And so now we see a new person with whom God will be bringing this new covenant. Not Adam, not Noah, not Abraham or Moses, but this servant. And unlike the previous covenants that included the death of animals, the servant himself will be the covenant. He will be the covenant, which I believe is pointing to the death of this servant as the ratification of this covenant. What's more, verse 6 tells us that, again, unlike the Mosaic covenant, This new covenant will not just be with the Jewish people, but with all of the nations. And then when it commences, it will open blind eyes and free captives and cause people to give him praise. Now, the reason why we need to sit up and take notice here is because this here, although it's a subtle little comment, I recognize it's subtle, but this begins a major shift in the overall message of the Old Testament. Up till now, God's work has always been through the Jews. And ever since the book of Exodus, it's been through the Mosaic Covenant specifically. But now things change. As far as I know, this is the first reference to the New Covenant in the Old Testament. And remember, even the phrase Old Testament and New Testament, these are really just the Latin ways of saying covenant. Uh, We live in the era of the New Covenant or the New Testament, and we are New Covenant believers, and we read the documents of the New Covenant, which we call the New Testament. So now with this introduction here, This message of the new covenant will be one of the key themes that we're going to find through the rest of the prophets. We're going to see this in greater detail in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. We'll see it also alluded to in various other places in the Old Testament as God announces that there'll be a new way that he deals with the nations. And so this is a big deal. And going back to Isaiah 42, we see that this new covenant will be brought to the people by this servant. And then the next section of verses gives us the appropriate response to this new covenant. If you look at verse 10, verse 10 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them. And so now we're seeing here that God's people, those who enter into this new covenant, will be singing a new song celebrating the new things that God is doing. When you read the Old Testament songs, often you'll notice that they are recounting God's work among the Jews. It's a beautiful thing. It's great. And I just love how they rejoice in the Lord's work among them. But now that God is doing a new work beyond just the Jews and among all of the nations, we can now sing a new song of him in a new way because of the new works he is doing throughout this world. In the next set of verses, verses 14 to 16, the Lord basically alludes to this new covenant, these new people as giving birth to a whole new entity. And so he says, I have kept silent for a long time. This is verse 14. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now, like a woman in labor, I will groan, I will gasp and pant. And so this new covenant, when it comes in this world, it's going to be producing like a whole new life, a whole new baby, a whole new thing. It's going to just completely redo everything. Going on to verses 18 to 22, then give us a window into the events that will surround the arrival of this servant when he establishes this covenant. On the one hand, in verse 18, the deaf will hear and the blind will see. In other words, those who should not be able to hear will be able to, and those who should not be able to see and understand will be able to see and understand. And yet in verse 20, the opposite is also the case. Uh, Those who should see and should understand, they don't. 
And they suffer a fate in verse 22 where they're going to be plundered and spoiled and just hidden in prisons and become prey for the powerful. And then verses 23 to 25 end on this note, that the people who refuse the obvious arrival of this new covenant will be given over to destruction. They'll be raised by the wrath of the Lord. And once again, as new covenant Christians, we see how these prophecies have unfolded in the life of our Lord. He came with gentleness and kindness, but was rejected. And those who you think would reject him did not. And those who you think would be ready and waiting for him refused him. And so they were passed over and this whole new covenant, this whole new kingdom was started as something new through birth pangs, through pain, through labor, but it came. And the message of this new kingdom is still going out throughout this world, even today. And so just for a moment, let's just jump to the New Testament where Jesus established this new covenant with the disciples in the upper room in the Last Supper. He said in Luke 22, verse 20, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And that completely ties into what we're seeing here in Isaiah 42, 6, because the servant has been appointed as the covenant and Jesus is the covenant himself. It's his blood that is the covenant. And then, of course, the, the, the new covenant was inaugurated with the blood of Christ on the cross. And then after his death and resurrection, it was announced to all the nations. And if you and I are not Jewish, but we're followers of Jesus Christ, then you and I are a part of those nations which have come to God through the new covenant that Christ has established here. So with all of this, what's our takeaway? Well, first, we need to be sure that we actually have embraced this new covenant. Here in Isaiah 42, we're seeing the prophecy of this coming king who's going to be establishing this new covenant And he did. And so Jesus offers to make this covenant with you. He offers to be your king, where you'll be one of his people, his citizens, part of his family. He'll pay the price for your sins and he'll bring you into his kingdom. And you'll learn of his ways and you'll obey him as one of his kingdom citizens in this world. And so the question would be, have you accepted this covenant? uh, Where you're going to die to your old life, learn his new ways and walk with him. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. But these are the terms of the covenant that he offers to us. True believers may not understand all of these details at first, but basically that's the gist of what they're accepting when they call upon Christ as Lord. Now, false converts are just looking to get out of hell or just feel good about themselves or something else. But true Christians have accepted this offer and they've entered into a covenant with Christ. And if that's you, well, the Lord tells us how to respond in verse 10. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. And we sing a new song to him because he has established a new covenant with us. We rejoice that he has called us out of this world to be a part of his kingdom, which is yet to arrive, but will one day be established for all the nations that we ourselves might be among them and walk together as God's people. And so when we live in light of this, we recognize that all around us, we're seeing things that are ultimately not going to last. It's all going to burn, basically. There is still a kingdom that is coming that is yet to arrive. And we need to be focusing on that. We need to be setting our minds on things above and investing in the things that matter for eternity there in Christ's kingdom. Well, with that, we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.